is happening at Missouri Nation Online Ground School. Jason here. Coach Ray, good to see you. Holly, great to see you. Shalom, right back to you from, from Israel. Benny, Nick, hey Stuart, great to see you. Hey Chris, great to see you on here as well. It is the Secret to Perfect Landings Live. And we're gonna be starting here in oh, about exactly six minutes. Check in in the chat. Where are you watching from? Let me know. I want to give you a little shout out as well. Looking forward to it. It's the Secret to Perfect Landings Live starting in six minutes. M Zero A Online Ground School. Jason here. Three minutes. We're going to be rolling here. James Clifford in Oklahoma. Great to see you. There's Don. G we can get started now, everybody. Don Gibson from San Diego is here. My good buddy. Good to see you. Jesse in Naples. I've been there once or twice. Hey Jesse. Good to see you. Mike. Mr. G. Good to see you. Brandon. I like the Disney profile picture. Great to see you. Uh, Barless. Bill. Garrett from a little south of Ocala. I've been there once or twice too. Victoria, Vincent in New Orleans. I like the hat in your profile picture, Vincent. Uh, Jeffrey, Yusuf, great to see you. Bergen, hey Lane, good to see you. Checking in. Lane's just here to see if he wins the bag, Magda. That's what I really, that's what I really think. Not only is it the secret to perfect landings, but we're giving away that great package from our friends over at My Go Flight. Um, everyone, username Toxic Bounce just popped on. Do you think that's related to landings? because we are talking about the secret to perfect landings. And if there's a toxic bounce here, well, well, we can work on that. Now, if it's the Piper Plop you suffer from, I don't know if I can help that, but a toxic bounce, maybe we can help. I'm just teasing. Hey, we'll be back here in just a bit. Mazir, good to see you. Hey, Jimmy, great to see you. Like the profile picture too. Travis in Jacksonville, been there once or twice as well at the old Craig Field. So good. Hey, Lori, great to see you. Listen, we're gonna be rolling. What's that timer say behind the chat? One minute, 45 seconds. We write, hey Paris, great to see you on here. It's like twice in one week, Paris, huh? Pretty cool. All right, I'll be back. Let me, Magda tells me I gotta rest my voice, Carlos. 
in Land Lakes, Florida. So in uh, one minute, we'll be back. M0A Online Ground School, Jason Shepard here. Welcome to the webinar tonight. So thankful, so blessed you're taking time out of your busy, what is it, is it a Thursday? It seems like a Thursday. There's a long weekend coming up though, I think as well. So excited to be live with you all tonight. Thanks to everybody who's watching over on YouTube, watching simultaneously over on Facebook. I've got the chat pulled up so I can say hey to Walter. I can say to username Ramp Hex. Kevin, first time watching from Tennessee. Telvin, Joe, great to see you. Username, Mr. Properties Plus. That's Mark in Naples, who's learning at Rexair. I, I know Mark. Great to see you all on here as well. Hey, do I have, uh, like some others up here, do I have any first timers in here? If this is your first time ever on a webinar, type in me in the chat. I wanna get to know you a little bit. And by the way, tonight we are diving into what I call the secret to perfect landings. The secret to perfect landings, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my stories because listen, back in the olden days, I need a little help in my landings here as well. Look at these first timers, Peter, uh, Mazar, Kumar, great to see you, Mike Stoops, Jimmy, uh, the M and R, Jason, there's a Jason on here, Magda, I mean, that's just great. James, Ed, DG, Benny, uh, Jeffrey, great to see you. Hey, Michelle, nice to see you on here as well. Uh, John, John says he's here for the back. He just, he's just here. You know, Lane told me on the member-only webinar that we should just put his name on it and just send it to Pensacola. That's what he told me earlier. We'll find out who the winner is. It's not just the bag. There's good stuff in there as well. We'll dive into that. Hello from Japan. Well, hello from Florida. Right back at you. Great to see you. Hey, Al Gibson. Hey, Bergen. Hey, Vincent. Congratulations, everybody. First time on a webinar. That is so good. Well, since there's so many first timers, I'm sure you all know this, um, but I'm Jason and my beautiful wife and I, Magda, run a little thing called m 0 Way, and we believe it's the best online ground school on the market, private instrument commercial, and maybe, maybe there's a rumor going around that a CFI course might just be launching in Oshkosh. We'll see. Hey, speaking of that, uh, where are my ground school members at? Type in me in the chat. Paris, you better be typing me in the chat because this is, this is twice in one week I've got to see you now. Ground school members, Holly, where are you? Type in me in the chat. Lori, where are you? Uh, type in me in the chat so I can say hi to all our amazing ground school members. Dave G, I know you're out there. So many of our great members. Lane, hey, there's Josh. Josh, we missed you on the member-only webinar this week. Not that I was taking attendance. But I, I didn't see you. I didn't see you. Hey, Lori. Hey, David. Great to see you. There's Al Gibson. Just signed up. That's awesome. David. Hey, Mr. Vargas. Good to see you. on. Have you made it back over to the lake, Jonathan Vargas? That's just what I'm wondering. Michelle, as always, great to see you. There's Lane. There's Bill. There's Holly. I knew they were typing in there. That's awesome. And listen, if you are not an online ground school member, and you would like to be, because as all those people, all those me's that flew by will tell you, it's a pretty cool place. It's not just, a, here's a bunch of courses. Hey, here's how to pass your written test. Here's how to pass your check ride. 
It's that and so much more. It's an amazing community, as you see from all of that. Uh, M0ATrial.com, by the way, if you want to take a two-week, no-strings-attached trial uh, of the courses as well. One membership gets you access to all the courses. Why? Well, because a good pilot's always learning, right? Two reasons we're here tonight. First off, well, we're doing, going to do it last. We're giving away this great uh, uh, giveaway from our friends at MyGoFlight. Not only their amazing PLC bag, but also um, their Flex suction mount and the universal cradle for your tablet. Hopefully your tablet is an iPad, but I will not hold it against you. I, I am an Apple fanboy. New members, uh, new people watching. I, I am an Apple fanboy. So if you fly with like an Android tablet, I mean, I guess we could be friends. I'll still talk to you but hopefully you have an iPad. Uh, we're, we'll be giving that away at the very end. And the real reason we are here, Peter, thank you for the kind words, by the way. The real reason we are here is for the secret to perfect landings. Now, for those of you that are new, we like to keep it real with everybody. We're gonna kind of cut through the fluff and stuff. So if you will just step into my humility corner for just a second, and if you would be so humble to type in me in the chat if this applies to you. By a show of hands, by typing in me in the chat, who could use just a little bit of help with their landing? Just a little bit. I'm sure you're basically Chuck Yeager or Amelia Earhart, but type in me in the chat if you could use just a little bit of help with your landings. Magda, you type in me in the chat for me? Oh, look at all these me's coming in. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Kumar. Thank you, Geneva, Dave, Mark, Mark from Naples. Hey, Mary Martin, thank you for your humility. Thank you. Hey, T. Soto and Tailwheel. I think I will raise both hands for working on Tailwheel landings. Chris, thank you for your humility. Roger says me sometimes. I think everybody could, could say sometimes. And, and even I, all these thousands of hours later, Sometimes a little bit of love needs to happen. Michael Harding says, love this. I'm here 10,000 hours and still learning. I love the humility, Michael. It is so, so good. Hey, Chandra, good to see you. Um, Josh, you're right, especially on tailwheel, right, Josh? Um, yeah, Chris Ritchie said, no flap landings. Yeah, I hear you on that. So thank you uh, for the humility because, you know, admitting we could use a little bit of help on somebody because we as pilots, well, we're not always the most humble bunch. There's a reason there's a thing called the macho hazardous attitude out there. We don't all exhibit it, but pilots, we're a little proud of what we get to do sometimes. So thank you for being so humble with this. Now, I need to understand, though, what, what we're working with here tonight. So I want to ask you another question. Again, this is totally interactive. You can see we're streaming the, the, the uh, comments for you over here as well, so you can see both simultaneously YouTube and Facebook. And I want to ask a question again. And the question is this, what makes a great landing? In your own words, what makes a great landing? Do you just go with, uh, I can use the airplane again <laughs> approach? Do you want to give me some techniques? I mean, what do you believe makes a great landing? While you all are typing that in, I'll, I'll tell you, um, our uh, six-year-old, Gavin, has really taken a liking to flying, and he's wanted to sit up front uh, lately every time we fly, and we used to put him in the back, and he said, he said, Daddy, I'm gonna land the airplane. He can't see over, he, had the, he just could see the synthetic vision. I said, okay, Gavin, you fly down. Tell me when we're on the ground, and he's flying down. He's so serious. And we get to about 50 feet, he goes, Daddy, I think we're on the ground, and I look, and I go, Gavin, I think, I think you got a little bit more flying. He goes, okay, I'll keep flying it. <laughs> was so committed. I share all that to say that, listen, we all, we all whether you're six years old or, or, or 60 years old, we could all use a little bit. So let's read some of these, Magda. Will you find them for me? Um, John B. says, one the pilot and passengers can walk away, away from. I, I agree with you. Anna, it's like she stole my next slide. Now, but Anna's been a ground school member for a really, really long time. So I expect, I, I expect that. Joseph, I like it. Stable pattern uh, all the way to the approach. Um, username one dream soul says uneventful. Roger says being safe and a landing that makes your passengers uh, want to fly with you again. Check. I t totally agree. Totally agree on that one. Stewart says stable approach, hitting your target, being at the right airspeed. Nori from Japan. It, it, it's like 
It's like nobody's been watching this presentation before. Airspeed is king is so, so right. Uh, can we show Don Gibson's? Because Don Gibson really, in one word, summarizes what makes a great landing. Butter. Or ghee, if you're going the organic route, maybe. We could, we could do that uh, instead. Uh, Coach Ray, you're spot on. Center line, energy management, proper control. Uh, Telvin, of course. Good. Javier, of course. Okay, so this, you've explained it to me. We know what makes a great landing. You all have shared with me these ingredients. Smooth touchdown. Uh, Dave G says, awesome. My passengers even wonder if we landed or if we we're still flying. Yusuf says, a stable approach. Dale Brown says, airspeed. Uh, uh, so many of you have given so many great ingredients that I need to ask you a question. You clearly know what it takes to make a great landing. Well, and here's the next question I have for you. Then what makes landing so difficult? You know everything. A stable approach. You got to nail your airspeeds, these great patterns, longitudinal axis, straight down the center line, so no side loading, no, no pinch in a tube or anything like that on the tire. Um, great traffic patterns, energy management. You've named all these ingredients that if you can put all of those ingredients in the right order, it works out. But what gets in the way? Pete says, or sorry, Peter, the wind and nerves. Mark says, fear. Uh, MGS1 says, unstable approach or wrong airspeed. T Soto 247, no two landings the same. Alary, same thing, too many variables. I, I hear you. Who said that? Weather always has a say. That's Joseph. Uh, Nori says, a crosswind, no doubt. Anna says, it's the pressure. Yeah. Michelle says, the gusty winds. And Michelle, you've had some gusty winds lately, haven't you? Um, yeah, I get you. <laughs> Mike says, rudder tensioner failure, AKA the old right leg just wasn't, wasn't strong enough to keep that right rudder pressure in there. I love Kevin's not staying ahead of the plane. Yeah, th these, are, these are all accurate things. I love Lane's humility. Lane said, me, I get in the way. And by the way, Lane just passed his commercial pilot check ride. Congratulations, Lane. And congratulations on the humility to realize, yeah, I may be a commercial pilot, but landings are still difficult for some. And I want to share with you uh, really a, a quick story just to relate, um, to relate to you all because you may see a very polished product that we put out there in our online ground school or even the free videos we put out on YouTube or Facebook. You see this very polished product and Coach Ray and the M0A team works very diligently and Coach Ray will be the first and myself to tell you that we don't always get those, those videos perfect and right. A lot of work goes into those and I'm not perfect either. And I've shared this story for many years but there's so many new people here, I feel compelled to really share it again. Um, I was a young 16 year old kid I was flying a 1967 Cherokee 140. Where are my Cherokee 140 pilots? I'm talking manual flaps and lasso trim wheel. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say a lasso trim wheel and the manual flaps? A good, that's a good airplane right there, okay? It, you felt like you needed extra hands to do everything uh, in, the, in the old Cherokee 140s like that. And uh, my instructor gave me the ultimate challenge. And she said, Jason, if you can land on runway eight, Two six at Ocala, which is 3,000 feet long, 50 feet wide. Now, mind you, all my landings have been on, on 3618, 200 feet wide, 7,000 feet long. It was, it was easy to land on. She said, if you can land on the little runway, 826, I'll solo you today. I thought, challenge accepted, sign me up. A little macho hazardous attitude maybe. Who knows what it was? And... I get on the downwind and I realize my downwind's over like that because it's a 3,000 foot long runway. I barely had time to get established. I think, oh, I better, better hurry up here. Power back, first notch of flaps in there. I'm going, I'm watching. But I was so used to landing 3-6 that I literally had my geographical points as to, okay, you turn base over the high school you turn final around this clump of trees in the farmer's field. Like, have you ever been so familiar with an airport that you had all your perfect checkpoints for your traffic pattern and it made it so easy? And then all of a sudden I'm on a different runway. I might as well have been in a different airport and thinking, I don't know when to turn base anymore. I don't know when to turn final because my instructor always just said, well, turn final around the clump of trees and there were no clump of trees. And I didn't have that, that depth perception to know 
when, when do I make these turns? So I'm doing this, I'm all over the place, I'm a little bit high, I'm a little bit low, and then here we come on final. And on final, this is 2-3 Mike Zulu, but on final, has anybody ever been doing one of these on final? You're just like, it's like you're practicing your S turns. You know, you're practicing your S turns out there on final, well, that was me. I'm practicing my S turns on final. I am way, way, way too high uh, to, to bring this thing on in. I'm trying to save a landing, and I wanna pause there for a second. If you've ever found yourself in a position where you're trying to save a landing, or if you ever think of yourself in your head going, oh, I can fix it, I can save it, that needs to be like this automatic cue to say, I should go around. I, I've really adopted this idea that if I just find myself trying to save a landing, what I really need to do is go around. And I, I, was, I was 16 years old, I had, I don't even know how many hours, not many hours at this point, and I'm left and I'm right, and I'm, all, I'm so far left of the run. I'm talking, I'm way over here, and the runway's over, over there. I'm not even close to it. And finally, I'm getting low. I'm at you know, 20 feet or so at this point. And finally, my instructor says, well, Jason, what are you going to do? I said, well, I guess I should go around. And she says, I think that's a great idea. And instead of following my go-around procedure of you know, full power and climb out, I grab the 30 degrees of flaps. You know that emergency brake style Cherokee 140 flaps? I grabbed those before adding full power at about 20 feet and I took all the flaps out at once. Now, if you've done any amount of flying and you know you're at 20 feet with no power, you're back to idle, and you take all the flaps out at once, there is only one possible direction you can go in that situation, right? And it's down. We went from 20 feet to the ground, which was grass, by the way. And I'm, this is like, we were so, people always ask, you're so lucky you didn't hit a runway light. I'm thinking, the runway lights were so far away. Like I was, I was out in the part where they didn't even mow. Like they just let the grass grow. It was, it was, it, it was like I was a bush pilot. It was my first soft field landing. Unintentional, but it was my first soft field landing. We hit the ground so hard. Like I'm talking the headset, the old David Clark headset jarred a little bit. My instructor said words that I cannot repeat here. And she took over the controls, was back on the yoke, taxied us through what felt like the jungle, back up onto the runway, and, um, and taxied us back. And it was a very awkward taxi back. I didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. I was literally shaking. I was so nervous. And I'll never forget, she kept the airplane the entire time. She taxied all the way over to the ramp, shut it down. We both put our headsets around our neck, and again, this... My instructor was sharing this. My instructor was a great, great lady. Um, she, she was being hard on me from a place of love. And she said, Jason, maybe you're not meant to be a pilot. And that phrase broke me. Like, I literally, I was a 16-year-old kid. I remember going home to my parents' house and just crying. But you have two options. When you're faced with adversity like that, you could choose to wallow in your sorrows and say, maybe they're right, maybe I'm not meant to be a pilot. Or you can choose to take the approach that says, in every adversity, there's a seed of a greater advantage. So after my one hour, let's say, of wallowing in my sorrows, I took the second approach. My parents were quite smart and, and chose to say, listen, Jason, there is something you can learn from this. In every adversity, there's a seed of a greater advantage. So instead, I decided to become a student of landings. And I became, I learned everything I could. And this is before, this is well before YouTube and, and, and really anything decent aviation-wise being out there on the internet. These are, this is, I'm 16 years old. This is a long time ago. So I'm diving into the PHAC, the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. I'm diving into the Airplane Flying Handbook. And I'm trying to learn everything I can about landings. And what I discovered was really three things that were holding me back from making perfect landings. And the first one is this, and you all mentioned it in there, in, in the chat when I asked what makes a great landing, because you know it. It's a perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern. How'd this click for me? Well, I realized 
why could I land so well on 3-6, but I couldn't land very well on 2-6? And I thought, wow, well, on runway 3-6, I had all my points. Turn base over the high school, turn final, go right around that, uh, right on around that clump of trees, everything else. And I had these prescribed points. I said, wow, because of geographical things on the ground, I can make a perfect pattern each and every time. But I'm not always going to land runway 36 at Ocala. I don't want to be a pilot that just flies around Ocala. I want to be a pilot that goes to other airports eventually. So I'm going to have to learn what a perfect pattern looks like. Um, and, and at this time, I was really big into basketball. And I remember as I, I was meeting with my basketball coaches, they would always tell you, hey, Jason, when you're setting up for a free throw, do the same thing every time. Step up to the line the same way. If you want to dribble the ball three times, spin it in your hand once, bend your knees and shoot, whatever it is. And you'll notice that from high school ball like I was playing up to the pros. They step up to that free throw line and they do the same thing every time. Because they want, whether it's home court, whether it's the home net, the away net, if they're home, if they're away, it doesn't matter. A free throw line's the same distance and they want to do the same thing every time. I thought, wow, you know, with my, with my traffic patterns, I'm not exactly doing that. I'm doing these trapezoid type patterns and then I'm, I'm taking all these shortcuts. So you see a perfect pattern is none of that. It's none of these trapezoids. Um, it's none of these shortcuts, cutting corners. And we'll talk about, well, what do I do when ATC tells me I enter on a two mile left base or I enter on a you know, five mile final? How do I handle that? We'll talk about that here in a second. But you have to learn with your eyeballs what does um, a 45 off my touchdown point look like so I know when to turn base? What does a proper base look like? And then by the way, what is the wind doing to me? You see, and I'll show you an animation from inside the online ground school real quick. You see, if you wanna fly that perfect rectangle and we enter on like a downwind like this, all is well and good when I have the wind right behind me. But many times you may have a crosswind and you're getting blown away from the runway and you're gonna have a really big base or you're getting blown closer to the runway and you're gonna have no base. And even when the wind is normal, when you're on a crosswind or a base like this, you need to be crabbing into that wind and always working to make those adjustments. Now, I, I know this, this animation makes it look very easy and, and maybe type, type me in the chat and go, yeah, Jason, this, I wish I could make my patterns look as perfect as this, uh, as this animation does. Type in me in the chat if that's you. I get it. But we've all been flying patterns where you've got a crosswind and you're on the downwind and you're doing one of these, right? Or you're coming over this way instead. And what's happening is you're shortening up or lengthening your base. You need to be making that crab angle in there and making those adjustments. It is all about your ground track. It's all about your ground track around that rectangular pattern. So a perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern. One thing I'm asking myself on downwind is, am I creeping in? Am I creeping away from that runway? Or am I doing pretty good? On base, am I getting pushed away for a big final? Or am I getting pushed in for almost no final? A perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to chair fly this with me quickly. And if you are not using the power of chair flying, you really, really should be. So if you're in a place now and you wanna like close your eyes or whatever and just listen to this and visualize this, you can. Uh, and I take this to extremes sometimes. And if there's any of my former students on here, they will tell you, and all the online ground school members will tell you this because I teach them the same things. And I didn't make this up. I learned this from the Blue Angels, by the way. Um, I was at Sun and Fun one year, and I was watching the Blue Angels from a distance. And the planes were all parked. They were in their full uniform, and they were on the ramp. And they were just walking around like robots on the ramp. And one of them was talking. And I remember just watching, what are they doing? And they were literally, the seven of them, walking around the ramp in the positions they would be, 
making the moves when the lead says, you know, this, making the moves, making the passes. They were chair flying, but literally walking the ramp in a miniature scale of their entire performance. And I thought, why can't we do that with our landings? I got back from Sun and Fun, and I started to work with some of my students who were really struggling with their landings. And I got sidewalk chalk, and I went on the ramp, and I drew runway 36 in miniature scale. And I took my student, I said, okay, I'm in the right seat. You stand right here next to me. We're in the airplane together. Let's roll down this runway. And we would walk down the runway. And that's what we're gonna do right here. I want you to take a visual walk down the runway with me. Let's do runway two, three at Williston. So visualize this with me real quick. If you wanna close your eyes, by all means, uh, if not, just listen. This is a powerful exercise. This is the kind of stuff I want you doing in your car while you're trying to fall asleep, whatever it is, okay? You're in the left seat, I'm in the right seat. I'm just talking you through the landing, the takeoff for, just for starters. Let's pull out on the runway together. We pull out on the runway, Williston traffic, Skyhawk 23 Mike Zulu's departing runway 23, Williston. Even make the radio calls like you really would. We get out on the runway, you double check 23 on your compass, you see runway 23 outside, you get squared up on center line, your heels begin to slide down the pedals and hit the floor, your toes move to the bottom of those pedals because you don't need those brakes anymore. You smoothly start to apply full power. By the time that power gets all the way to full, you glance down at your airspeed indicator and you say out loud to yourself, airspeed alive. Your eyes then come across the screen and you across the instrument panel and you look and go, oil pressure, oil temperature, okay. Engine gauges, green. We're rolling down. You feel literally the airplane wanting to pull you to the left because of many left turning tendencies, in particular the torque effect. So your right leg begins to get a little bit stronger as you apply just a little bit more right rudder pressure. As you're rolling down, you're focused on holding center line. The speeds begin to pick up. You glance down at your airspeed indicator. It says 65 and you say out loud, rotate. You don't rip it back, you're not a blue angel. You don't baby it back, you're stronger than that. You just smoothly bring that yoke back and before you know it, we're flying. We take off, you glance down at your heading indicator to make sure we're holding that heading 230 and we're climbing on out. Life looks good. If I have a back window, sometimes I'll even glance out back just to make sure because I know I can be holding heading 230 but with the wind, I can still be drifting left right. So a glance out the back window, or if I don't have a back window, sometimes I'll glance straight down to say, do I see too much runway, not enough runway? What do I see down there? I begin to climb out. Now the Williston Airport's at a, we'll call it sea level because it's basically Florida, right? Or it is Florida. So we're climbing on out. Everything is looking great. No one's in the traffic pattern. We get up. We're still on that departure leg as it's called. Our altimeter gets to 700 feet. Remember, we turn left crosswind 300 feet from traffic pattern altitude, which in this case, we said sea level, so we'll call it 1,000 feet as our traffic pattern altitude. As we get ready to turn left crosswind, we initiate that turn, one hand's on the yoke, one hand's still on the throttle, I make that left turn, and as I'm turning, I call out Williston traffic, Skyhawk 23 Mike Zulu's turn left crosswind, runway 23, Williston, and I initiate that turn. It's a climbing turn. I'm looking ahead to make sure I'm climbing out, turn the right way. I glance at my airspeed to make sure I've still got a great VY, maybe even slightly faster than VY by two, three knots, rather be on the safer side of that. We come up and I think, okay, I wanna put two, three on the right side of my compass because I'm starting to think I need to fly. Jason says a perfect land starts the perfect traffic pattern. I need a perfect 90 degree angle. Use your heading indicator and put two, three at that 90 degree point. Remember, wind can vary that ground track, but that's a strong place to start if you don't know when to roll out. Then you can look back over your shoulder and kind of confirm that. But our crosswind's awfully quick because it's just you and I in the airplane and 75% and fuel, we're climbing quite good. Before you know it, we're at like 950 feet. You anticipate that because a perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern isn't just related to our ground track, it's also related to altitude. So you anticipate that as well. You begin to lower the nose and bring a little bit of power back and you time it just right where enough energy just pops you up to 1,000 feet and you hold it. We get to 1,000 feet and before you know it now, it's time to turn our left downwind. We make that turn. 
uh, Williston traffic, Skyhawk 23, Mike Zulu's turn left downwind, runway 23, Williston. We're now on the downwind. I've got the throttle where I want it, and I know that trim is a poor man's autopilot. So I don't want to fight the airplane. I've got a, you know, a minute or two on this downwind. Let's go ahead. Let's trim up the airplane because I should be flying this airplane with just two fingers. Now, I'm established on the downwind. And on that downwind, I'm looking at that runway and I'm asking myself a profound question. Am I creeping in too close to that runway? The wind's blowing me towards it. Or am I being blown away from that runway? Or is my heading pretty good? Use ground references out in front of you in addition to measuring the distance you feel you are from that runway to keep on flying that downwind. Now, gone are the days of just being thankful but to put it down that piece of pavement. I gave my online ground school members the task a few weeks ago on our member only webinar, this idea of every landing has an aiming point and a touchdown point. Stop being thankful just for putting it down on the ground. Every landing I'm aiming for something. So let's say it's the numbers in this case. Um, I come up, I'm on downwind, I'm now a beam my touchdown point, a beam my numbers, let's say. I have a procedure I follow. In two, three, Mike Zulu, again, we're chair flying this together. Carburetor heat on. Power back to about, I don't know, 1700 RPMs or so. Um, and then 10 degrees of flaps. And from there, we lower that nose. You have to lower that nose. If you just bring that throttle back a little bit here um, and add the flaps in, uh, ground school members know this, and, and uh, most of you on here know this, if you're going 110 knots in the downwind and you do it in the wrong order, if you go flaps, power, carb heat, when you add in flaps, where does the airplane have a tendency to wanna go? It wants to balloon up. And right there, you're giving away your perfect pattern. You've gotta get the syntax right. In our case, it's carb heat, power back to like a run up RPM, 17, 18 RPMs, get that nose coming down, then 10 degrees of flaps, okay? You have to establish that you're truly coming down. You have to, you have to establish that you're really starting that uh, uh, descent and getting it coming on down. Check that vertical speed indicator to make sure you're coming on down. Now, as we start that descent, good, four, 500 feet per minute descent, we're managing our airspeed, we'll talk about that here in just a second. And then when do I turn base? Well, I turn base when I'm a 45 degree point from my touchdown point, not from the runway, from my touchdown point, and I'll turn my base. Now, this is a common mistake people make here, is they forget to keep bringing that throttle back. You have to remember to bring that throttle back. So often, people just get a beam their touchdown point, go carb heat, um, you know, power back, 10 degrees of flaps, and they never touch the power again until they're on final. I am constantly making these little millimeter type adjustments to bring that power on back to help manage my airspeed. Because the second point of really the three points here is this, airspeed is king. Airspeed is everything. And I realize a bunch of you are typing in the chat that maybe the sound is delayed. I don't know, did it start out that way or is it getting worse? Um, I don't know, it, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know if it's rendering or what it's, what it's doing here. I apologize for that. Uh, maybe it'll catch back up, might just be buffering or something like that. Either way, the content is still good. The thing is, airspeed is king. You have to nail your airspeeds. If you are too fast, you are gonna float. If you're too slow, gosh, you're gonna really risk hurting yourself, that, equ that equation. And your airspeed is changing based on the, on the legs of the traffic pattern as well. I'll give you an example. This is for 2-3 Mike Zulu. So this, this is not gonna apply to every airplane here. But on downwind, I like to be 90. On base, I like to be 80. On final, I like to be 70. And then coming over airport property, I like to get down to about 65. Again, that's for 2-3 Mike Zulu. I can't give advice for every airplane. I don't know, are you in knots? Are you in miles per hour? Are you heavy? Are you light? There's so many factors that can apply to this. Like BK said, 
Every airplane has different speeds. You need to find out what works best for your airplane. But I can tell you, for 2.3 Mike Zulu, which is just a humble 1972, 172 Lima, it's 90 on downwind, 80 on base, 70 on final, and 65 over airport property, I call it, as I continue to slow. And you've got to adjust those numbers. Now, those numbers can change. If you're at maximum gross weight, you should probably add five knots to all those numbers. If you're going into a 15 knot wind, you should probably add five to 10 knots to those numbers and probably not use full flaps. There's a lot of factors. You need to have your base numbers for downwind, base, and final, your foundation, I shouldn't use base and base, your foundational numbers for downwind, base, and final, and then know that I don't get any slower than those, but I certainly can add five knots to them if I'm heavy, if it's windy, if it's a crosswind. You've got to fly the numbers. Why? Because airspeed is king. Now, back to our chair flying exercise here. We're on base. On base, once my wings are level, and let me explain something real quick. I want to get to the mic Zulu. And you don't have to agree with this. There are many people that don't agree with this, so you need to do what you believe is best. But this is my, my personal advice. I never add flaps in in a turn. Why do I never add flaps in in a turn? Can you do it and, and have a long, prosperous career in aviation? Sure you can, if you know what you're doing. But you have to remember, uh, as what we do for a living, I talk to student pilots and I talk to ATPs every single day. So I have to give the, the prudent advice. And the prudent advice is, I don't, and I personally don't, add flaps in in a turn. Why is that? Um, I'm on base to final, let's say. And ooh, I'm a little bit high. Uh, I'm turning, so when I'm turning, uh, I'm trading my vertical component of lift for my horizontal component of lift because I'm turning, and geez, I'm a little bit high. I'm gonna add some flaps in, but remember, in a turn, basically one wing is producing more lift than the other, so if I add flaps in, one wing's then gonna be producing more drag than the other. And by the way, like we said earlier, when you add in flaps, where does the nose have a tendency to want to go, right? So here I am, base to final, one wing's producing more lift than the other, one flap will be producing more drag than the other, I add those flaps and the nose wants to come up. I'm just adding ingredients to a possible base to final stall spin scenario. Now, if you are a smart pilot, can you do it if you keep that nose coming down? Absolutely, it would totally work out. But you gotta remember, I talk to five hour student pilots and 5,000 hour pilots on a daily basis. And the general rule of thumb is um, I'm not adding flaps in, in a turn. And that, that goes for me too. I've flown with many, many of you on this webinar um, and, and you know that to be very, very true. Um, yeah, Rodman and Musfara talked about it. it could upset the airframe. There's, there's, again, that, is it, anything's possible. I, I totally get it. I'm thinking more from a stall spin type scenario. So back to our chair flying, on base, once I roll out wings level, I add in my next notch of flaps. In this case, it's 20 uh, degrees of flaps. Now, I'm asking myself a question, even way out here on base, and I ask myself really three questions. Am I too high? Am I too low? Am I right on glide path? Even on base, people make a mistake of waiting till final to ask this question. But even on base, I'm asking myself, am I too high? Am I too low? Am I right on glide path? And what is the answer? What do I do based on the answer? If I'm too high, what do I do? You take out power, actually. If I'm too low, what do I do? I give it a little bit of power. People wanna to try to control it by doing one of these and not in the pattern. You keep that same pitch attitude and you adjust the power. Who understands this phrase when I say, I pitch for, I, I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude? Boy, when that phrase, I remember the day when that phrase clicked for me. I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude. Man, when I could apply that, my landings changed. And if that phrase kind of makes sense to you, one day it will click for you, 
and, when it, and, and back me up on this, Stuart. Um, you know, back me up on this um, uh, Florida spotter, Dan Kastner. When that phrase clicks for you, it, it feels like you opened up a new dimension of your landing. You're just like, oh, you mean I can keep the nose coming down, but slow up my descent or, or speed up my descent, whatever needs to happen like that. Kumar says, my CFI repeats that statement like a mantra. I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude. So hold your 80. We just said airspeed is king. Hold your 80 by putting your, not this, that probably won't be 80. That's probably more like 80. Hold it where you need to and adjust the power based on are you too high, are you too low, are you right on glide path. Look at Austin's comment. The moment it clicked for me, landings got easier. You know, if that phrase hasn't clicked for you yet, I want you to like to go to sleep just as you, I hope you chair fly this again while you sleep tonight and literally think, what does Jason mean when he says, I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude. It's one of those things, you just have to experience it in the airplane. I don't know how else to, how else to teach it other than, than exactly that. I leave my nose where it's at and use my power to adjust for altitude. It, it's gonna be a game changer for you when that finally clicks. Now, we're on base and we need to turn final. And we need to turn final not too early and not too late. We need to work to time our turn perfectly. But if you have wind, like if you're my runway and the wind's coming from you, I need to time my turn because I'm going into the wind, right? To roll out perfectly on final. But what if I have a crosswind? If I have a crosswind coming this direction, I might wanna turn a little bit late to be rolled out. Or if I have a tailwind, I might wanna turn a little bit early to roll out. You have to think about constantly, where is the wind coming from? And work to make those adjustments. You roll out on final. All is looking good. I want you to ask yourself that same question on final. Am I too high? Am I too low? Or am I right on glide path? And you adjust power to do that. On final, I added my last and final notch of flaps. I slow to my 70, I get to my 65 over airport property, but even before that, while I'm doing all of this, I pick a point on the runway. I want you to pick a point on that runway. And I used to do this with my learners. I would get like a charcoal pencil or an Expo marker, and I would draw a literal circle on the glare shield, on the inside of the windshield, and I would say, Put your aiming point in that circle. And if that circle, if the aiming point starts going down here and you go start going up here, what's happening? Well, I'm too high, put it back in the circle. What happens if my circle goes down here, my aiming point goes up here? I'm too low. And you don't need to literally draw, not everyone's gonna be crazy about you drawing on a windshield, right? I did this in 502 Romeo. Um, draw a circle about your, a little bit below where your eye line is uh, just draw it in your mind if you need to. And I mean, I just stare at that point. I watch it creep up or creep down or creep left, creep right. And I make those constant adjustments by picking that point on the runway. Even way out on final, I find people have a hard time deciphering center line. Now, if you are in the left seat, Typically, you want to put that center line on your right shoulder. CFIs, if you are in the right seat, oddly enough, because of the parallax effect, you want to put that center line on the center of your chest is where you want to put that center line. So left seat, right shoulder, right seat, center of your chest. And on final, you're just riding that center line all the way on down. And then comes what I'll call the most important step. And it's an interesting step. And I, I figured this out um, early on becoming really a CFI. First off, I was reading through the old versions of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge and the Airplane Flying Handbook, and they, they never used the word flare. But everybody, all my CFIs told me to flare. I was using the word flare. And if you look even today in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, it says to transition to a landing attitude, or transition uh, to land, uh, or they'll use the word round out, but they don't use the word flare. But we as CFIs use this word flare. And I think, I'll never forget, I was flying with a student. 
Um, and we were coming into land, and I, I can't make this up. It's one of, my, one of my scarier flights. I have a lot of stories teaching students. We're coming in. I'm teaching the land. I say, we, we get to, you know, 10 feet, and I go, okay, flare. And I can't make this up. He takes that yoke all the way back. It probably hit his belly button. He pulled that yoke so far back. We're at idle and going like this, and the stall warning horn's on, and I go, and I reach right down the throttle and go, okay, go, we're going around. And we come back around, I land, I say, you know, if I could give some constructive feedback, what happened there? <laughs> there was nothing constructive about it. Like, what happened? He goes, well, Jason, you told me to flare. I said, What's your, what is your definition of a flare? And he told me, he goes, well, you know, when I was a kid, I would watch the space shuttle come in to land. And the newscasters always says, and it's in its landing flare. I thought, wow. And he goes, yeah, for that matter, you know, an, an airliner, when it comes in to land, it, it flares. Those, there's a, those mains are on the ground a long time until that nose touches. And I thought, wow. Yeah, the space shuttle flares. Yeah, a 777 flares. But a 172 doesn't really flare. You risk striking the tail um, if you do that. So I thought to myself, we've got to ditch this word flare from our vocabulary. Or at the very least, can we give it a new definition? And I like to use the definition that the PHAC and the Airplane Flying Handbook originally used, which is to transition. And what are you transitioning to? You're transitioning essentially to slow flight down the runway. Slow flight down the runway. Now, I'm not suggesting a three-point landing by any means. Your main wheels touch, followed by your nose, but it's, it's, it's quick, unless you're doing a soft field landing. You never wanna find yourself, if you are coming in to land, and you do one of these, or if you ever find yourself having to stretch to see down that runway, you should never be in a position where you're rounding out, transitioning, flaring, whatever you wanna call it, it's fine with me, where you can't see down that runway. Because the real secret to a great landing is when you transition the nose up, and just a degree or two up, you transition your eyes down that runway. You have to take your eyes down that runway. How far down that runway? Look at the tree line for all that matters. Um, could you step back in my humility corner real quick? Just over here in my humility corner. Type in me in the chat if this has ever happened to you. You're coming into land. Life's looking good. Ooh, this is going to be such a good landing. You come in. You get ready to transition. All of a sudden, boom, you hit the ground. And the ground snuck up on you. You're like, that was sooner than I thought, right? And the ground literally just snuck up on you. Who's ever landed before they thought they were actually going to land and the ground snuck up on them? Type in me in the chat. If that is the case, I always ask my students when they go, oh, I didn't expect that. I say, where were your eyes? And they go, just, just barely over the spinner. <laughs> if the ground is ever sneaking up on you, it's because your eyes are too close. You're trying to stare at that first centerline stripe. You're trying to stare just barely through that spinner. Take those eyes and look towards the tree line, 1,000, 2,000 feet down the runway. Use your peripheral vision to maintain yourself on center line and look down that runway. If you are smacking the ground sooner than you think and doing the piper plop on in there, or I can't think of anything for Cessna or Cirrus, you guys can think of something better. <laughs> If the ground is sneaking up on you, you're looking too close. You've got to take those eyes down the runway. So as you transition the nose, and you do transition to just barely a nose up attitude, you also transition your eyes down that runway. Now, what can help you with all this? Truly one of my best landing tips, and if you've ever done this, give me like a hand wave emoji. Slow flight down the runway. I mean, I know we teach a lot of cool tricks. Like I'm sure you saw, I do that cool trim trick for steep turns and we do all these neat little things to help you. But of all the cool, if I had to make a list of Jason's top 10 cool tricks to help you be a better pilot, number one would be slow flight down the runway. Why do we even practice slow flight? If you ever wondered, I usually think we practice slow flight just to get really close to a stall up high and it made no sense to me. And then one day a smart instructor said to me, 
well, Jason, you know we practice slow flight to get better at our landings. I said, what? How, how is doing something up there at 4,000 feet going to help me better down here at, at 15 feet? They said, because when you're in slow flight, the ailerons are sloppy. There's hardly any air flowing over them. They're not doing much. The rudder is a little touchy, though. Think about when you come into ground effect in that transition phase, right? You can move the ailerons like this, and not a whole lot's going to happen. It takes a little more rudder pressure to move that airplane. You are practicing how to control that airplane in ground effect as you transition. How do I know when to transition, right? That, that's, a, that's a timing issue that you're going to have to continue to work on. You can certainly transition too early and find yourself in a go-around situation or at least eating up a lot of runway. You can find yourself transitioning too late and having a, would you guys say a Cessna slam? I saw that. Um, I'm telling you though, slow flight down the runway and Craig, when you do it, I want you to go to a big runway. I want you not like, don't go to Albert Witted, go to Sarasota, go somewhere with a long runway, Craig. And I want you to hold these wheels, not feet, inches off the ground. I mean, I want you to almost kiss them. Now, you're gonna have to be adding a little bit of power just to maintain slow flight, but I want you to feel what the airplane feels like. I want you to burn that sight picture into your brain as you see what that actually looks like. Slow flight down the runway. And as you transition the nose, you transition your eyes down that runway. So what are really the three secrets to a perfect landing? Well, the first is a perfect pattern. Next is airspeed is king. And lastly is ditch the word flare from your vocabulary or at least change its definition and instead transition. And your homework to practice, not only is to chair fly while you fall asleep tonight, think of that phrase, I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude, but it's also to go schedule a flight where you can practice some slow flight down the runway. And of course, if you need more, well, we just wrapped up an entire Secret of Perfect Landing series with our online ground school members. Uh, the next two months, we're going into a flight planning, VFR and IFR flight planning series. But if you need an amazing, if this teaching style resonated with you and you need an amazing online ground school, I encourage you to take a two week free trial of our online ground school by going to m0atrial.com so you can check that out. Hey, it is question time now. If you want to start asking your questions and we are going to reveal our winner of the My Go Flight bag, you had to have already entered. We already picked the winner. Uh, there'll be another, actually a really, really, can I say everybody's a winner next month? We're working on something very cool where everybody's a winner. That sounds salesy, sorry. I won't do it again. Um, we already have our winner for this amazing, uh, uh, the entire m team flies with my GoFlight bags. Uh, you're also getting the flex suction mount as well as the universal cradle as well. We're gonna be shipping that out to you, to one lucky winner with that. So let's go ahead, let's, uh, let's give it away. And then I, wanna, I will spend I, uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes doing some, uh, question and answer as well. So, Mike, do we have a drum roll sound effect? I know I ask this every time. I'll do it. Congratulations, Christopher, Cody, Harrison, in Texas, I believe. Congratulations, he had Christopher, but Cody was his email, so I added that in there too. He knows who he is, Christopher. Cody Harrison out in Texas. Congratulations, my friend. The Emsory team is going to reach out to you uh, to get or verify your shipping information. And we're, it's a big box that's coming your way. We're going to get this shipped out to you. Thank you to my GoFlight uh, for so generously donating this. Uh, and thank you to everybody. A couple thousand people entered the contest. Really, really impressed with you all playing full out. So listen, congratulations, Christopher Cody Harrison in Texas. Let's open it up in uh, to questions now. Anything um, you want to chat about? Anything, well, anything aviation related is fair game. How about that? Austin asks, how did the annual inspection go for 2-3 Mike Zulu? Good. Not great, just good. Um, it was just down longer than I thought. Um, I had an exhaust leak. So I shared this story a few webinars ago. Um, 
Last winter, you know, those Florida winters, they're so frigid. The, the one day we had to use heat, Magda and I were flying, and we had just dropped the kids off at my parents' house. We flew into the Leesburg airport, and we were getting ready to leave, and Magda's always cold. It doesn't, she's just always cold. So I turn the cabin heat on, even as we're taxiing. The doors are still open, because I just taxi with the doors open all the time. Um, and um, as soon as we stop to do the run-up, this weird beeping noise goes off. And I literally go, what is that? I have never heard this noise in my life. Is it the ELT? What is this noise? I'm looking around and go, oh, it's the CO detector. So I turn the, carbon, I turn the uh, cabin heat off and disarm the, the, the CO monitor. I go, well, you know, we have the doors open. Maybe when we stopped, some back, we had a tailwind. Maybe some backdraft um, came in. I don't know. Maybe that's what happened. So, okay. We, we do our run up. We shut the doors this time. I said, listen, I know it's cold. Let's just check it one more time with the door shut. I turn the cabin heat on. I don't even get the cabin heat all the way back to on on the little pull switch and the CO detector is going off again. I go, this is something legit. So we, we close it and, and ventilate the cabin and sit there for a second. Okay, it's gonna be a cold flight home. And the kids left their Moana blanket in the, in the airplane. And I'm not allowed to share the picture, but Magda, the whole flight home was wrapped up in a Moana blanket um, and to the Mike Zulu flying home. So um, I tell that to tell you, it was Austin, right? That we, um, we had to get a whole new exhaust from PowerFlow and it just, this whole supply chain shortage thing is legit. It just took forever to get our exhaust back. So, uh, so that was that. Um, Nori, we have uh, said we need some FOI prep videos. Nori, my friend, you need to go to m0atrial.com. We have a full FOI online ground school and the rumor is, I'm not spreading it by any means, at Oshkosh, there may or may not be a CFI online ground school. That's just the rumor on the street, Nori, so we got you covered. But yes, we have a full online ground school for FOI. I don't know if Hunter and John Dela Cruz and some other, uh, Lane, you're gonna be going through it here soon, I'd imagine. Um, many, many alumni on that course as well. So, um, all right, on YouTube, username Ultra, what's the average cost for a private pot? Remember, it's a certificate in 2023. I'm gonna give this one to the chat. What, if you have recently done a private pod certificate, what did you spend? Put it in the chat and then somebody, maybe Dave G, you could write some quick uh, code uh, on the blockchain to create the average for me. That'd be great. Um, Walter said, hey Walter, on landing, do you cut the power all the way to idle and when? The answer is yes. When I have the runway made. When I have the runway made. Do you remember back in the fly with Jason sweepstakes? I was flying with Hunter. I'm surprised I haven't seen Hunter um, on here yet. Um, have you, Magda? No. Uh, maybe she's flying, but um, I gave Hunter an engine failure on a downwind, and she was so far out on downwind that when I pulled the throttle back to idle, we couldn't glide in to land. And I taught her, I said, you never want to have a perfectly good runway in your sights and not be able to make it. So Walter, once I have that runway made somewhere on final, I don't know, 50 to 100 feet, that I know if I lost everything right now, I'm still gliding this thing on in. That's why I bring it back. All right. Luis, Jason, please help. When I flare, what's your definition of flare? When I transition, we'll say, the nose will swing to the side. I try to correct it by either ailerons or rudder, but I end up swinging it back and forth. Well, the problem is you're trying to correct it with both. Remember this. Your ailerons are sloppy. There's hardly any air flowing over them. They're doing nothing, basically, in that transition phase. I could take the yoke and go like this, and the airplane would barely even rock. It's all about the rudder. When you transition, you have to remember the left turning tendencies. You're changing the angle of attack of that propeller. When you bring that nose up, you're still, you still have to have a little bit of a heavier right foot with that to keep from side loading the airplane. Now, obviously there's a crosswind situation. Yes, you need to get some aileron in there. But if you are trying to correct with rudder and aileron at the last second, I'd argue you're over correcting the airplane. I'd work in some finesse in there. Uh, I wanna take John's, cause that was good. John said, uh, Alwine, if you transition and balloon, should you add power to, to cushion the landing? John, if I transition and balloon, it's because I carried too much airspeed and it's just a go around at that point. There is no need to try to add power and save it because aerodynamically, John, if I'm, I'll do it from the side here. If I come in 
and I transition by transition with too much speed and I balloon and I need to add, I balloon, look where my nose is. I need to add power to cushion it. You're not gonna see that runway coming and you're gonna go ba-boom right on in there as, as, as Gavin used to say when he was little. He used to take his race cars and go ba-boom, just like that. So you're gonna ba-boom. Um, all right, a um, few other things. Keep asking questions here. Um, who, type in me in the chat. Who is gonna be at Oshkosh this year? We will be there. We're in Hangar B, Hangar Bravo. Literally, you can't miss us. Right when you walk in, we're in that center aisle right there, the Hangar B indoor booth. Come by, say hi at Oshkosh, take a picture. Wanna hear more about you and your story and how good your landings are becoming since I last saw you on this live stream. Um, Hangar B, I'll see you at uh, Oshkosh. Um, Lane, you're not gonna have to wait long. It's literally coming out at Oshkosh, like the day, the Monday of Oshkosh. So you don't have to wait that much longer, my friend. It's, it'll be ready for you. All right, where are my Oshkosh people? Nor you're gonna be, nor you're coming from Japan, or you're just happy to be in Japan right now. Season, you're gonna be there? Of course Pete's gonna be there. I've got, I've got, Pete always brings me snacks, so I like to see it. Jessica, great. I saw you, congratulations earlier, Jessica, on, I think it was Instrument. That's so great. Chris, see you at Oshkosh, his home state. I love those Wisconians. Is that what you are? A Wisconsinite, a Wisconian? Geneva asked a question here. And these questions probably don't have to be landing related. Uh, you wanna know how to buy an airplane. We can ask anything. Geneva said, I have a problem when coming into land. I'm told I'm not holding the plane back enough and end up sinking the plane and slamming it down on the runway. Now hold it back, adapt that transition enough and sinking the plane. Geneva, let me ask you this. Do the same approach, but come in five knots faster next time. I would argue there's only two possible things happening. You're either transitioning well too high and ba-boom, or you're coming in too slow and also ba-boom, okay? Try to come in a little bit lower, eyes down the runway, and if that doesn't work, try to come in five knots faster and see if that helps you um, with that. Dustin, look forward to seeing you. We're the, we'll be there all week. Um, Dory, we're bringing in 2-3 Mike Zulu, and Coach, Coach Ray's flying a 2026 SR-22T. Not even out yet. He's, he's just fancy like that. Um, okay, hey, Dave. Assuming you made your turn onto final at a normal distance, what should your approximate altitude be in a 172? I ask because I'm routinely high on the glide slope for the time for final. So it's funny you say that. On, um, in 2-3 Mike Zulu, I have a 500 foot AGL call out. If you watch some recent videos, you'll hear the, air, the Dynon go 500. Um, and I literally can time that to about as I'm starting my turn to final. Uh, go watch recent YouTube videos, you'll see it. It'll go 500, right, as I'm turning like base to final. And that's how I know, oh, okay, I'm good. Or if it says it early, or if it says it late. So that's kind of like my audible call out for me. Turning base to final is usually about 500 feet AGL, typically, typically. Lane said, should I get AGI? Lane, the answer is absolutely. Um, AGI you don't have to renew, like a typical CFI and everything else. It is a great little fallback if you need to do something. Um, yes, the answer is absolutely um, yes with, uh, with that one. Joseph said, how do you keep cool without AC in the hot summer afternoons? I taxi with the doors open. Um, I wear undershirts, lots of deodorant. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, people, it's funny, You'll, I always get YouTube comments. Oh, you forgot to close the door. No, no, that was very purposefully open. And usually someone chimes in and backs us up on that. Um, I tax with the door open. My, I don't have an opening window on my side of 2-3 Mike Zulu either. Um, yeah, you just, I mean, it's easy to say you fly in the morning, but you just gotta make adjustments. You know, a, two, three, uh, a 172, you can fly with the window open up to certain speeds. You gotta check your POH um, as well. All right, um, let's see. Jaden said, I always struggle judging when to start my transition. Jaden. The solution to that, I promise you, is slow flight down the runway. Jaden, I am personally assigning that to you as homework, and I expect an email back to report back how well it worked for you. In a perfect world, Jaden, you would do it this way. Take off with an instructor, go do slow flight on the longest runway you could find, great, go around at the end, 
come back around, do a normal landing. I promise you it'll be the best landing you've ever done. I'm willing to bet money on it, Jaden, and I expect an email or, or an Instagram DM or something to tell me how, uh, how it worked for you. Um, Jacob said, hey, Jason, I'm currently a private pilot just starting working towards my instrument. When should I configure the airplane to land um, when during an approach? So in instrument flying, I like to be configured, not fully configured like 30 degrees of flaps, but before the final approach fix, I like to be 10 degrees of flaps, gear down if I need to, before the final approach fix. After the final approach fix, you focus on flying that airplane, and if you're in real instrument conditions, the last thing you need to be doing is adding in flaps and having to chase that glide slope. I teach you keep that 10 degrees of flaps and adjust those power settings, and when you break out, then you finish configuring that airplane up. You don't need to be configuring the airplane in solid IFR in a descent, chasing the glide slope, because you know what flaps do, right? They make that nose want to come up. Don't make that approach any harder than it has to be. Hey, Eric Deagle, great job on your project you're working on, by the way. It is really, really good. I, I want to make one little fix, but it's really good. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, all right, Mark's going to let me know how landings go tomorrow. I expect it. I, I expect it here. Um, listen, I know it's getting late. If you love these webinars, I do these every Tuesday at 2 p.m. with our online ground school members. Again, that URL is m0atrial.com. We have a full private, instrument, commercial, FOI, and maybe a CFI ground school here in a few weeks. Uh, so go ahead and check that out as well. Pass your written test, pass your check ride, but most importantly, be that safe real world pilot. You think these free live streams and free videos we put on YouTube are good? Wait till you see the actual paid content inside the online ground school. The cool thing is it's membership based. For one membership fee, you get access to all the courses, private, instrument, commercial, FOI, because you're like Nori, you're talking about doing FOI and probably CFI eventually, like Lane is doing. Lane's going back through the private pilot videos as he's getting ready to work towards CFI as well. Like It's this full symbiotic circle of life. And that's why I give you access to all of that. So Italian Mark, great to see you on here. So listen, it's well past my bedtime. Um, and I got to get filming maybe another new course that we're also working on uh, bright and early tomorrow with the M08 team. So I'm um, gonna check off for now. I do go back and read all these comments. So please feel free to leave some more comments as well. And thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy Thursday evening. Uh, congratulations to everybody on the past written test, the past check rides, and just thank you so much. Thank you for being such a blessing to myself, my beautiful wife Magda, this amazing team here at M0A Online Ground School. It is such a blessing to get to serve you all. Have a blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your evening. Go chair fly a lap around the pattern, and most importantly, remember, that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great night, everybody. I'll see ya.